So without further ado, I want to welcome Alan to the stage. Alan is the founder and director of strategy at Growth Gorilla. Growth Gorilla is a no BS content promotion and distribution agency for B2B SaaS companies. They help software companies that are already publishing quality content get the word out to acquire backlinks, increase traffic, and signups. Alan, the, the floor is yours. Um, please share your screen. Hey, guys. Welcome. Right. So, yeah, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to mention is we had the no BS in the title basically before it got cool. <laughs> But now I kind of need to remove it because everybody's starting to do with the no BS agency for this and for that. So yeah, that's a, that's a good reminder. <laughs> yeah, cool. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, uh, before I do that, two things. Uh, the first thing that Travis mentioned already, feel free to leave the questions in the comment and we'll get to them at the end. Second thing is uh, we'll also be having spreadsheet templates to share with you guys. So please stick until the end and we'll be giving those away to you all so you can take whatever we cover today and kind of implement it uh, straight away into your business. All right, so let me go ahead, share my screen. Cool. Can you all see the screen with the good. fancy 80s graphic? Okay. <laughs> right, so at the topic of today is how to get out of the content graveyard and into page one of Google without the guesswork. The guesswork part is very important because we'll be covering a ton of tactical aspects that essentially are based on data, right? So that's my main kind of uh, unique selling proposition. Uh, so before we dive in, a quick introduction again, I'm a founder at Grow Gorilla. We help uh, software companies for the most part that are producing quality content to get more backlinks and traffic from the content through what we call strategic link building, okay? And so in my free time, I'm also a DeLorean, uh, uh, like I drive a DeLorean, okay? And I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. And so this is my car. And this is me being completely miserable while working to fix the car. And that happens quite often, <laughs> okay? So if you uh, like don't wanna uh, put your hands into engines and stuff, don't buy a DeLorean, all right? Cool, so let's jump in. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to do is cover the concept of the content gravy. Uh, uh, the content graveyard. So what is the content graveyard? This is a concept that I came up with essentially to define a situation that is pretty common uh, with a ton of different companies, right? So what is this? As a, so what is it like, uh, kind of exactly? So this is how your content publishing and content production typically looks like, right? So it's like a linear staircase. You publish two articles one month, two articles the next month, and it keeps going on like that, right? So it's predictable, it's steady, and it looks like this. The problem that a ton of companies don't really understand is that content promotion, uh, link building, look more like this, right? So it's basically an exponential curve. So what a lot of people do is they typically get to this point right here where they think they have put out 80% of the effort and only gotten 20% of the results. So they think, oh my God, I've worked super hard on this, but I'm not seeing any movement, right? So what's going on? So what they do at this point it's typically they just decide to quit, okay? And what they will do is they will just keep publishing content in the hope that it will magically rank. But typically that's not what happens, right? So a lot of companies are gonna get into what we call the content quality threshold. And what that is, is basically that point where content quality alone is not gonna be enough anymore to be able to break into the top five, for example. And so what you typically need is <clears throat> so it's usually more backlinks, okay? So this is what we call the content graveyard, basically where content goes to die. <laughs> the content graveyard looks something like this, okay? This is a chart that is in one of the spreadsheets that we will be giving away. So essentially what the content graveyard is, is a situation where 50% plus, basically of your traffic producing pages are ranking page two and lower. So essentially these pages are somewhat like dead, right? They're not doing much for your business or for your traffic. So to fix this, what you typically need is something that looks more like this. It's a constant flow of backlinks to support your content production effort. This is what's gonna help your content production and content publishing to snowball over a period of time and to be able to break into page one, okay? And so the other reason why we want to kind of do this is to simulate what looks like a natural uh, scenario, right? So if your content is ranking in page one, chances are it will start to acquire 
backlinks naturally, okay? So we want to kind of simulate this situation for all of your pages, even the ones that are ranking page two, okay? So that Google is basically saying, okay, this page is being uh, liked, people are linking to this page, so let's push it into page one and see what happens, okay? So what we want to do is essentially get the pages that are in the yellow and in the, and basically the, uh, the orange bucket and push them into the green bucket, which is the top three positions essentially, okay? So the companies that are successful uh, in the end, <clears throat> basically are the company that can stick uh, with this process for the long term uh, to essentially ride the curve over time, all right? So let's have a look at uh, three big problems uh, that most companies face when it comes to promoting their content or uh, to link building. So problem number one is they don't know which pages to promote, okay? So you probably have a ton of pages on your site, but time and resources are limited. So which pages do you choose to work on and which other pages do you just leave out, right? So it's kind of difficult sometimes to make this decision, especially because to you, so all content you create is basically like very valuable, right? So you need to make the decision. Some pages you will unfortunately have to leave out and some pages you can focus on. Problem number two is what kind of backlinks do you need? Okay, not, not all backlinks are created equal. There's a lot of factors at play like quality, quantity, relevancy, and a bunch of other things. So it gets very complicated very fast. So this is something that we're gonna have a look in more detail later on. So lastly, problem number three is how do you actually do it, right? So you know which page to promote. Once you know the type of links, so how do you actually go about like getting these links, okay? Uh, so. The other thing to mention is that most companies have a content uh, production team, but not many companies have a content promotion team. So that kind of often gets like overlooked, all right? And the main reason for that is because maybe you don't have the resources, you don't have uh, like the team in place to do that, or you just don't have the expertise or the experience to know what to do and how to do it. Next up, let's look at the three big mistakes that are keeping your content stuck inside the content graveyard. Before we look at the mistakes, let's look at this. This is a study uh, made by Ahrefs uh, that's essentially saying how 91% of the pages that are published uh, basically don't get traffic from Google. And 5% of those pages only get like 10 visits uh, per month or less, okay? So this is basically what we would call content graveyard. It's a ton of content that's not doing much, okay? So mistake number one that's keeping you inside the graveyard is the fact that the pages don't have backlinks. So Ahrefs found that 60% of those pages didn't have backlinks, okay? Uh, which typically means that there's a lack of what we call promotion. So either the pages are not being uh, liked enough by people or they're not being spread enough, uh, right? So like the main goal of link building should be to spread the word about your content. It's not to ask people to like necessarily link out to your page. So you should first off provide value and then if they like the page, <clears throat> chances are they're gonna link to it. So mistake uh, number two is that you're targeting keywords that don't have traffic potential, okay? So some of those pages that Ahrefs uh, looked at had a ton of backlinks, but still they didn't have any traffic. The reason for that is because if nobody is searching for a specific topic and you're writing about that topic, then you're not gonna get traffic, okay? So you need to make sure that the keyword that you're writing about has some search traffic potential. And mistake number three is targeting content with the wrong search intent on uh, search intent or content type, okay? So uh, Google typically aims to provide the most relevant results uh, for each query. So chances are that if the uh, search intent behind the query is informational and you have a landing page, then people are not going to want to look at that, right? So you need to satisfy what Google wants to provide uh, to people that are searching for the keywords. So uh, next up, let's look at the three main content promotion drivers, okay? So going back to the three uh, problems that we mentioned before, knowing which pages to promote, knowing the type of links and knowing how to do it. So how do we solve them and what are the drivers that we need to solve those? So the first thing that we need is direction. So we know where, so, so basically we need to know where we need to go, okay? Because if we don't know where we need to go, we're kind of lost essentially, 
The second thing that we need is precision. So we know exactly how to get there. And the third thing is momentum. So that we're able to scale up over a period of time and get the content efforts to compound, all right? Next up, let's look at five principles that you need to keep in mind uh, uh, while working through this, essentially. Principle number one is to think long-term, okay? So uh, remember the content graveyard graph that I showed you, okay? So we want to stick with this kind of work for the long-term so that we're able to, uh, to ride the curve, okay, over a period of time. People that quit too soon are the ones that end up in the content graveyard. The principle number two is data beats opinion. So SEO is not an exact science. Uh, so we essentially always try to game Google in, in a way or another, basically. But I strongly believe in controlling what I can control. And the only thing that I can control is my actions. Okay. And my action, uh, essentially, I strongly believe that they're more effective if they're based on data and not just opinions or assumptions. Okay. <clears throat> basically, what I want to do is just guess. Okay. Uh, principle number three is to plan quarterly. So we mentioned that we want to think long-term. So it's good to have a North Star goal for knowing where we want to go and knowing eventually like what kind of maybe topic clusters we will be wanting to rank for. Uh, but what we decided to do is that we work in quarterly sprints. The main reason why we choose the quarterly uh, kind of time frame is because we found that that's the most uh, realistic time frame. That's the shortest as well, uh, where we can sort of expect some kind of movements and some kind of results from the work that we do, right? So anything that's shorter than the quarter doesn't really uh, tell you much. <clears throat> but basically everything that's longer than the quarter starts to become too long, okay? Principle number four, stick to the plan. So it's very important to execute and don't get distracted. There's a lot of companies that chase after the shiny new ball, uh, but when they do that, things start to break and fall off the tracks. So uh, we don't want you to do that. And so it's very important to stick to the plan, be focused. And so essentially <clears throat> what you can do is reassess basically every quarter, right? So this is why we work in quarterly sprints. So we can use the, uh, the end of the quarter to see what's going on and kind of reassess the plan. Principle number five is to automate, but not too much, right? So there's a lot of companies that think Quantity is better than quality, but in 2022, especially, I seriously believe that we got to a, a certain point where doing things that don't really scale too much is the best thing, okay? So we want to think quality is better than quantity. So use automation, but sparingly and where it makes sense to save you time from maybe like repetitive tasks, essentially. Right, so finally, let's have a look at a better model to how to go about this, basically, right? Right, so going back again to the three uh, big problems, uh, knowing which pages to promote, knowing the type of links and knowing how to do it. To solve the first problem, what you're gonna need is to have a strategy, okay? So that you know exactly which pages to work on to be able to increase your traffic, signups or customer in the short term. For this, we have a three-step framework that we call the content promotion roadmap. And this is going to be one of the two spreadsheets that we will be giving away at the end. Uh, so the content promotion uh, roadmap is, uh, is basically a three-step framework, all right? So step number one is to determine what we call the keyword difficulty baseline, which is essentially your website strength. Step number two is to analyze the keyword to find what we call quick win pages. And step number three is to do a deep dive analysis, which is essentially making sure that the search intent, content type, and the content quality make sense for the keywords that you want to target. So let's have a look at the steps in more detail. So keyword difficulty baseline. First off, this is a concept that uh, uh, was created by Robbie Richards at the, at the SEO playbook. So credit for this goes to him. Uh, so the keyword difficulty baseline, uh, what is this? The keyword difficulty baseline is a concept to essentially visualize uh, like your site strength uh, for the period like as it is right now, okay? So if you think about keyword difficulty, you probably think about the standard metrics that you have, that you have in Ahrefs. But the problem with those metrics is they're good as a, like a baseline kind of generic uh, thing that you can use. 
Uh, but what we need to have here is QR difficulty buckets uh, that are customized for a specific website for the situation uh, uh, how it is right now, okay? Because chances are, if my website has a domain authority of like 10, for example, it's gonna be like uh, much weaker than, uh, for example, a site that has a domain authority of 70, right? So I want to know which keywords can I realistically rank for in the short term for my site, how it is right now. So to do this, we do uh, three things. Step number one is we export the top ranking keywords. Okay, so the keywords that a site is ranking for in position one to three. These are the keywords that we know that our website is currently capable of ranking for uh, quite easily, okay? So then what we do is we remove any falsifying keywords. So these could be the branded terms or any misspellings. So keywords that don't make sense, we remove them from the list. And step three is we assign the keyword difficulty buckets. So let's have a quick look at how this looks like in our spreadsheet, okay? This is an example of what we would call a weaker site or like a standard kind of site, right? So you can see uh, basically what you have here is the keyword difficulty level, right? Zero, five, 10. And what you have in the other column is the frequency, okay? Uh, the frequency is uh, how many keywords you have. Oops. Uh, so how many keywords you have uh, uh, that are ranking for this specific keyword difficulty level. So in this situation, for example, we have 28 keywords that are ranking position one to three uh, that have a keyword difficulty of zero, right? Uh, so then we have 97 keywords that are ranking positions one to three with a keyword difficulty of five and so on. Okay, moving down the list. Uh, so the graph is pretty useful for us to be able to assign uh, these keyword difficulty buckets. So easy, medium, difficult, and hard. So what uh, we typically do essentially is just look at the bars uh, here in the chart uh, so it's pretty clear that if I look at this, uh, basically I could consider the easy bucket, essentially everything that goes from zero to 10, right? Because this is the first kind of like bunch of keywords that I have here. So then it goes down. So then once it goes down, basically I consider this second bucket here as the uh, uh, medium bucket, right? So anything from 15 uh, to 30, so to here is the medium bucket. And then everything from 35, in this situation to 70, right? So two here, kind of like, so when it goes like fully to zero, like almost, uh, basically I consider this the uh, difficult. And lastly, everything that's above 70 is the hard keyword difficulty packet, all right? So then I type uh, these ranges in here. And so essentially what I'm gonna do next is take these to basically use them to prioritize uh, my content promotion roadmap at the end. So the next slide is an example of the same chart for a side that is much stronger, okay? So you can see the difference in here. Uh, they essentially, uh, the, uh, the easy bucket for them is much bigger, right? So they essentially can uh, quite easily rank four in the top three for keywords that have a difficulty of 35, which makes it uh, more easy, like easier uh, for them to be able to rank uh, higher for much uh, more difficult keywords, okay? So everything, you can see the difference like quite easily, uh, <clears throat> quite clearly from these two charts, all right? So once we did this, step number two is to get our quick win keywords slash pages. Uh, so step number one for this is to export uh, these quick win pages. The quick win pages are nothing more than our pages that are ranking uh, between position four and typically position 20. So between the bottom of page one and page two, all right? So right before the content graveyard uh, kind of uh, uh, gap. So what we're gonna do next is, is to again, remove the keywords that are not relevant. We're gonna remove all of the brand terms, like everything that is not relevant to our goal, <clears throat> which in this situation is to make more revenue from our content, right? So any keywords that doesn't have some business potential or any misspellings and branded terms, basically we're going to remove from the list. So this is the initial filtering that we do. The uh, next step is to assign the keyword difficulty buckets, right? So we're going to get these levels here, easy, medium, difficult, and the hard uh, buckets to basically assign them uh, to the keyword list uh, that we have uh, to this point. So we know essentially, for example, like 30 pages are inside the, the easy buckets and then the medium and so on. So this is useful for us to be able to prioritize the order of the pages that we're gonna be working on. 
step number uh, so also the other thing to mention in step number three is at this point we also get conversion data uh, this is typically what we get from the clients directly so it's very important if you're doing this in-house to have some kind of way to measure the uh, like signups typically or uh, conversion customers uh, directly from your content uh, which typically is at the url level right so the more granular uh, you have uh, like this measurement uh, the better it can help you make a decision on which pages you should be working on. Step number four is to use all of this data to shortlist the pages that are the most important from a business standpoint. So let's say we have 300 keywords and we can only work on promoting five per month for the quarter, right? So we're going to select 15 keywords slash pages, and those pages are going to be the one that we're going to be working on, right? And so the order uh, that we're going to decide uh, basically depend first off on the keyword difficulty buckets so we're going to be prioritizing the keywords that are in the easy uh, slash medium or maybe difficult bucket okay because we've seen uh, that those are the ones that are basically let me go back here right so what we want to do is prioritize the pages that are inside these like three buckets here to push them essentially as high as we can all right uh so the second uh, thing that we're going to use to prioritize is the ranking position, of course. So if a page is ranking position six and another page is ranking posi uh, position nine, then we're probably going to be wanting to push the keyword that is in position six first, right? Because that might be easier to get to position one, like three, two, or one. And lastly, the uh, third thing that we can use to prioritize this list is the conversions, signups, and so the conversion data, okay? Because because at the end of the day, if we have a keyword or page uh, that is ranked in position six, okay, <clears throat> like it might be easy to get it in position three, but if it's not like bringing you signups or conversion, then it doesn't really make sense. So we want to prioritize the pages that have some business potential, okay? So let's have a quick look at uh, how the last, no, actually here, uh, the spreadsheet uh, looks like, okay? So this is the analysis spreadsheet in the roadmap uh, template. So here we have all of those quick win pages with their volume, the position, the keyword difficulty. Uh, these two columns are the columns for the conversion data. In this case, they're, uh, they're empty just because this is a quick example that I did. And typically we get this data from the client, okay? Uh, the relevant column is what you use to mark the pages that are relevant or the pages that are not relevant. So you only proceed with the pages that essentially have a yes here. Uh, then we have the keyword difficulty bucket column here. Uh, you can see we have assigned those keyword difficulty buckets based on uh, the keyword difficulty that we have. And lastly, that's the short list column, uh, which is basically the pages that we have selected because they might have conversion, okay? So in this case, we're only going to be focusing for the rest of the analysis on these uh, five pages that we have in the short list. So moving on, uh, deep dive analysis, right? So this is the last part of the roadmap and it's also very important uh, because essentially if you want to build backlinks to a page those links need to go to pages that have the on-page side of things that's taken care of all right uh, the better the on-page optimization is uh, the more the links that you built are going to be effective so we don't want to go ahead and spend time money and resources in building links to pages uh, where they're targeting the wrong keywords or they're making some of the three mistakes that we mentioned before, okay? So step number one in the deep dive analysis is to check that the page is matching the content type for the keywords that it's currently ranking for. So we content type is basically, so if you have a blog article, uh, you want to make sure that the top 10 ranking pages are for the most part of blog articles. And that's because that's what Google wants to show to people. Uh, step number two is to check uh, that the page is matching the search intent that's behind the keywords that it's ranking for. Search intent is basically uh, like what the people that are searching for the keywords essentially are expecting to find. Okay, so if it's informational, you don't want to have like a page that's just giving a free tool or a landing page or basically things like that. All right, so you want to make sure that these two things essentially are matching. Uh, from your page to what's ranking on page one. And step number three is basically what we call a visual content quality check. 
<clears throat> plus we also run a content audit. Uh, the content audit, uh, we typically use Surfer SEO, uh, but you guys can use ClearScope as well. And I've actually just tested it right before the call. And I, and I actually think it's better <laughs> than Surfer. So yeah, uh, what I would do is probably use Surfer in this case. Uh, what you want to do is to make a note of the content grade uh, that you get from the <clears throat> from the report uh, that you get from ClearScope, right? So let's say that your goal is to get an A or an A minus, and your content is scoring a B or a C. For example, you know they should improve that content before you move on uh, to promoting it, all right? And step number four is once you have all of this data, <clears throat> then basically you take all of that and you make your best like best decision based on on the data that you have in front of you all right so as i mentioned before uh, <clears throat> you can use the queue difficulty buckets you can use the conversion data and you can use uh the the thing uh the search traffic potential or any other kind of data that you have inside the spreadsheet right this is what the uh, right part of the spreadsheet uh, looks like so you have a column for content type column for search intent and a column for content quality. Okay, so you can see basically the first two columns is oops, the first two columns is a yes or no, so whether it matches or it doesn't, and the third column is a yes, uh, yes, for otherwise uh, to improve the page. So if you get a lower score, then you will mark it as improved, right? So you know that your content team uh, needs to take the results from the content audit or the content like report uh, to essentially try to improve the content uh, to get it up to par to what's ranking, All right? So next up here, uh, you have the content score. So you can write it down. Here, you can put the content audit link. And lastly, uh, like all the way to the right, you have the priority. So the priority numbers that you will have in here is the final kind of order for the pages that we'll have to work on uh, for the quarter, all right? Cool, this is it. Let me just drink a bit. All right, moving on. Problem number two, right? What kind of links do you need to acquire? To solve this problem, number two, you're gonna need a plan, all right? So, so the plan is basically knowing exactly what type of backlinks uh, you need to acquire to be able to get the best result in the shortest time possible. For this, we have a three-step uh, framework again that's called the backlink analysis report. What this is, is step number one, we need to identify the link gap. The link gap is essentially knowing how many backlinks and how fast uh, we need uh, to acquire uh, to be able to rank higher. Step number two is to determine the link type, okay? So link type is in the sense of metrics, right? So typically domain rating, domain authority, the URL rating, traffic, and so all of these things that are more uh, metric uh, related. Step number three is to establish topical relevance. Topical relevance is made up of two main things. The first one being the topic. Uh, so the topic of the page where your link is in. And the second thing is the anchor text uh, that the link is using to link to your page. Right, so let's look at these in more detail. To identify the link gap, right. So this is a bunch, it's basically a bunch of calculation, right? So what we do is we have this link report that's built in Tableau Reader just because it makes it uh, like <clears throat> nicer to look at. Uh, but fundamentally, you can do most of the things either in a spreadsheet. And so the sheet uh, that we will be sharing with you guys is essentially a minimum viable version of this report where you can do some of these things, okay? So step number one is to calculate the number of referring domains that you need to close the gap. To do that, you essentially do this, okay? This, oops, uh, this is what the link report uh, uh, looks like, right? So the site, uh, so this section at the top is the SERPs. So the search engine result pages for our target keyword, okay? So this is basically our target keyword that's been selected here. So these are the sites that are ranking top 10. And so our client is the site here in the green uh, box, right? So they have a total of 10 referring domains for this keyword, for this page. So the first step that you need to do is to calculate the average uh, for the top 10 ranking pages for how many referring domains they have. So you can see the average in this case is 34. And so our client has 10. So the link gap is essentially the difference between the two. So 24 links, okay? So we need to acquire 24 links uh, to be able to close this gap, okay? So this 
is the first step. Step number two is to calculate the link velocity gap. Uh, link velocity is how many new backlinks uh, each page is basically building every month because uh, these pages that are ranking for this keyword, <clears throat> so they're not like static, right? So they're building links every month. So we need to take those into account as well. To be able to do that, you essentially do the same thing, but you can go in Ahrefs and they have the new link uh, report. So you can then filter to see the results for the last 60 days. So then you take the number that they're doing for the 60 days, you divide it by two. And so that gives you the number of new links that they're building per month, okay? So here in the report, we have this section here, which is calculating the average for the new links that uh, that each of the top 10 ranking pages is building every month. So then we take the number that we are building every month, we subtract it uh, by that. So this gives us the total link velocity gap. Okay, right. So once we have the total uh, referring domain gap uh, plus the link velocity gap, uh, the next step is to decide how long we want this campaign to be, right? So let's say that we want to work on this for 12 months. Okay, then we're gonna put 12 months in here. You can see this box here gives you the calculation basically. So I put 24 links, uh, which is the uh, link gap here. And then I put two, which is the new links every month in link velocity. So here I have the 12 months, which is basically the duration of the campaign. Step four is to know your cost per link, okay? For us, cost per link is a blended cost that takes into account everything that we do, the strategy, the admin, and so everything like that. For you, it can be something different. It can maybe be the cost of the links that you're getting from a vendor, or it can be the cost of the freelancer that you're paying to get these links. So, so you need to determine uh, your kind of like your own cost per link, right? So then you put all of these data uh, together. <clears throat> so what the report gives you here at the end is basically how many links you need per month and essentially uh, uh, how much this is gonna cost, right? So this is very useful for us internally to be able to provide kind of expectations uh, to clients, but also for companies to be able to uh, make the business case for link building, right? So many marketers, find it very hard to be able to convince their management uh, to the fact that they need to do link building, okay? So like a lot of times it's difficult to justify this uh, kind of expense. So this calculation can be uh, very useful to be able to do that uh, with actual data. So uh, step number two in the uh, link analysis is to determine the link type. So link type is, is metric based, okay? So we typically look at the domain rating uh, the URL rating, the traffic, as well as the follow versus no follow uh, ratio, okay? So domain rating, let's have a, a quick look at this. This is what we call the domain rating ranges, all right? So similarly to the keyword difficulty buckets, so Ahrefs uh, like only gives you the domain rating for the whole domain, right? But then you can also take the whole backlink profile for a website to also analyze uh, how their backlinks are distributed in in each domain rating bucket, right? So we can clearly see this is four different sites that I've obscured in here. Uh, but this site, for example, has 27 links uh, that are domain rating 20 to 29. Then they have 41 links in the 30 to 39 buckets and so on, right? So what this analysis tells me, uh, let's say that I'm this site uh, right here, okay, at the end. Uh, so these two are the top dogs, right? So if I want to try and to basically beat what these guys are doing <clears throat> to at least copy them, right? It's kind of clear to me that I should be focusing first, so at least prioritize the links that are in these buckets right here because this is where they have the majority of the links, okay? So I know that, for example, when I do prospecting, uh, for example, I can do prospecting to prioritize sites that are in the domain rating bucket 60 to 80, for example. Then and basically, I can also move down uh, to these other kind of like lower quality websites, okay? So this is the domain rating and URL rating range. So you can do the same exact thing for the URL rating, right? Uh, this is the same thing, but at the page level. So this is the top 10 ranking pages for the keywords that I'm trying to rank for. Uh, so here I can see uh, the exact distribution of their backlinks 
uh, by domain rating bucket. So uh, down here, I can essentially look at the same thing. So if I want to rank higher for these keywords, uh, <clears throat> then essentially I know that I should be focused uh, first uh, to be able to acquire links uh, that are inside this domain rating bucket here, because this is where they have the majority of the links. The second thing to look at is the traffic bucket. So you can essentially do the same thing. So Ahrefs gives you all of this data if you export a CSV. So it's pretty easy once you have this CSV to make charts and to essentially analyze this data to gauge uh, like all the different uh, traffic buckets. So you can get the traffic to the domain, uh, but also the traffic to the URL. So, <clears throat> so the spreadsheet that we will be giving away at the end uh, will also contain something uh, for this, okay? So here in the last bit here, <clears throat> yeah, you can see, oops, fundamentally, uh, the other three main areas that we look at, okay, for the link type. So this is the domain rating bucket. So with the report, we can essentially filter to only see the specific uh, domain rating range that we need. Here we have the URL rating bucket, the traffic uh, to the domain, as well as the traffic to URL. Here uh, we have the follow versus uh, no follow uh, a link distribution, right? So it's also important to have this kind of data. We typically focus mostly on the, so basically on the follow links, right? So we typically don't build no follow links for the clients, uh, but for companies that are doing this in-house, so it might be useful to have this data to be able to essentially know uh, if the competitors are doing something weird and maybe they have a huge distribution of no follow links, it might be useful and interesting to dive deeper to see like if they're doing something uh, like out of the box, right? That you can sort of copy there. Because having a more no follow links at the end, <clears throat> so it might be useful to diversify the link profile, especially if you uh, if you need to be more aggressive uh, with your anchor text uh, to be able to rank for the keywords. Uh, having more no follow links can be useful to be able to uh, uh, so yeah to diversify this link profile. Okay. Right, step number three is to establish topical relevance. Topical relevance is made of two main things that we use, uh, two main uh, data points and data set. The first one is topical trust flow, and we take this data from Majestic SEO. Topical trust flow is essentially the uh, niche or like, like topic bucket uh, that either your domain or page uh, backlinks <clears throat> essentially are coming from, right? And the anchor text type and distribution are uh, which anchor text type or distribution that your links essentially uh, <clears throat> basically are covering, right? So we're going to look at this in a second. This is, is what the topic analysis looks like. We have the left part that's basically the domain level, right? So we have the four sites here. And for example, here we can see that this site has 9% of the backlinks that are coming from reference slash education website. And then they have 2% of their backlinks that are coming from society slash people site and so on, right? So this is for the domain level. The page level is this one right here to the left. So what we have here is the keywords. So instead of having the site, uh, we have the specific keywords here for the columns. So this is telling us that for this keyword, 12% 12 12 of the links that are pointing to the top 10 ranking pages basically are in the reference slash education, right? So you can see, uh, so you can also see how this is kind of matching, right? Because the domain and page level, if the topic is the same, should kind of be similar. So this is helpful to, again, prioritize our prospecting efforts. So for example, we know that if we want to be more effective, <clears throat> the first topical trust flow bucket that we should be targeting to rank for this keyword is the reference slash education, right? This is gonna help us be more effective instead of just like try to get the best possible topic. Uh, right, so the next bit is the anchor text analysis. So uh, this is another thing that's very useful to be able to be more strategic, <clears throat> but also more effective, right? So what we have here is a distribution of the anchor text profile for each of the top 10 ranking pages for each keyword. So, so in this example, we have uh, three keywords, right? One, two, and three. Uh, these are the top 10 ranking pages for this keyword. So you can clearly see in this case, 65% uh, 
65% uh, of the links uh, that are pointing to uh, the number one results for this keyword uh, <clears throat> basically have a generic anchor text, right? So the four main buckets that we use here are exact, uh, other, uh, partial, and URL. So exact match is your exact keyword. Partial match is any keyword that contains some of the words uh, from the main keywords, uh, while other is anything else that can be like branded terms or like click here, see this, and so all these things, all right? Uh, lastly, the URL uh, kind of echo text is a naked URL, okay? So once you know these kind of percentages, it's kind of helpful for you to have something to shoot for, right? So a lot of times you're probably not gonna have control over the anchor text. The only situation in, in which you can have control is when you're doing guest posting typically because you select the exact anchor text, but in most situations uh, you won't have control. Uh, that said, <clears throat> so it's still kind of useful to know what you should be shooting for because for example, <clears throat> so if I know uh, that uh, like in this situation, right? So what I should be shooting for is to have 50% uh, partial match, 38% that are generic and lastly 4% URL. So if I know that I need to be able to match uh, this kind of distribution, then I can be more strategic. For example, I can uh, try to do guest posting where uh, to be able to increase the partial match kind of distribution, then I can use partial match anchor text, okay? So it's useful. It's not exact science, same thing with everything that I'm showing you today, uh, but it's all very useful data to be able to have a goal and something that you can shoot for to at least like do something that you can control, right? Because otherwise you're just guessing again. Right, so step number three, uh, to solve the third problem, what you're gonna need is to have a system, okay? Uh, so again, there's a ton of companies that are after the new uh, tactics, uh, tips or tricks, or like broken link building, skyscraper, whatever. Uh, that said, I uh, fundamentally believe that all of these things are great, but the best thing that you can do is find, uh, first off, a framework that you can use for every single strategy, okay? So, so this framework that we use here kind of allow us to essentially determine uh, the specific tactic that we want, but this is more strategy-oriented than tactic-oriented, all right? So uh, the first thing that I wanted to explain here is uh, the difference between what we do and what a lot of other people are doing. This is what's typically called the skyscraper uh, method, right? So you look at a competing page to then get the backlinks that the page has so that then you reach out to the same people to essentially tell them, uh, hey, can you please link to me because my page is better or my page is different and so on, right? So this is still working in some situation, but it's been abused as with a lot of other link building uh, like tactics and everybody started using the same templates. So it's really obvious when somebody's doing this. So instead of doing this, <clears throat> what we do is slightly different. So we look at uh, the competitor backlinks, uh, but we mainly do this so that <clears throat> then we can get an idea for what kind of topics those pages are about so that we can use those to generate a set of other pages that essentially are not linking out to anybody else. Right? So instead of trying to compete, to reach out to sites, to ask them to replace an existing link <clears throat> with a link, uh, what we do is try to find those pages where, <clears throat> where it essentially makes sense for them to link to us, but they don't have to replace anything, right? So it just makes sense. Cool. So let's look at each of the, uh, for the outreach uh, steps in more detail. So step number one, is to find what we call segments uh, together with the related keywords, right? So we use, uh, for this, we use a mix of Ahrefs, Google and Google Sheets, okay? Uh, but the main concept for this is, let's say that this is our main topic, right? This big link here. So for example, this main topic might have like, like two, three or four uh, subtopics, or we call them segments, all right? So we want to essentially, uh, to essentially expand the list or the topic that we have to be able to find subtopics where it still makes sense for them to link to us. So the main process for this is to ask yourself, uh, what kind of pages uh, would link to my page? What kind of topics are these pages about? Step number two is to also get your why, right? So why would they link to my page? Uh, is it because my page is more in depth than their page? 
Is it because maybe I have unique data that I can provide? Is it because I have a unique perspective, maybe contrarian, right? So all these things, <clears throat> they make a link valuable or useful, okay? So then uh, the last thing they can do is once we have brainstormed the initial list, uh, you can also expand this list using secondary or related keywords. So we like to typically go uh, basically on Google to type in a keyword, see what kind of results we get so that then we can uh, typically use the Ahrefs toolbar. It should give you like a couple of suggestions for related keywords that you can just copy and put uh, into your analysis, all right? Step number two is the prospecting, right? So prospecting is typically done in two ways, right? So the first way that uh, most people are doing is to uh, just set uh, uh, like basic metrics that are, <clears throat> that are always going to be the same. For example, you decide that you want the uh, links that are domain rating 20 plus, that have a, a traffic to domain uh, 1000 or 5000 plus, that have a page traffic of like one plus, so some traffic. <clears throat> and so the last thing is that they have some keyword rankings to the page, okay? The, uh, so this works quite well, but a lot of times if you do this, you might be missing out on sites that maybe have a domain rating of 10, but that are like super legitimate website, right? So maybe they're just like quite new, but chances are that maybe in six months they might get to 20, okay? So if you do this, you miss out on a ton of good opportunities. So what we try to do instead is take all of the data that we got from the link analysis to be able to more specific. So what we do is we take the specific domain rating range together with the traffic buckets, the URL range, so all of the data that we looked at in the example before, right? So all of these kind of qualitative data, uh, the specific range that we are here, specific range that we have here, the specific traffic bucket, together with maybe the, the follow, no follow, together with the anchor text. So we take all of that data to be able to have a prospecting list that's like super customized to our specific situation, right? So we don't want to just set uh, basic metrics just because uh, like that's what everybody else is doing, right? So most people just focus on setting these metrics because they read in a blog that this is what's called a good link, okay? So we don't want to do that. We want to base a decision, so again, on data. So what we can actually measure and see. Step number three is inspection. So, so at this point, we will have uh, like cleared up the list by removing the initial junk, okay? So all of the sites that uh, basically don't match the metrics that we set, uh, we essentially uh, remove them. So what we do next is to open up each page at a time to manually check and do a visual inspection for the site first, uh, but then for the page to make sure that it's uh, first off a legitimate website slash company uh, to make sure that it's still active, still publishing content and not uh, basically a dead weight site. Uh, we want to make sure that the content is good and informative and the last thing is, can we get a link uh, possibly above the fold for the page, right? Does it really make sense? Does it call for a link to be inserted there? All right. And so, uh, so step one here is very, very important because at the end of the day, uh, most people nowadays are having a, a very hard time in kind of avoiding the so-called uh, link farms, right? So what happens is you reach out to like maybe a hundred sites, uh, you launch your campaign. So then what you get is basically just 50 replies that are essentially the same. People sending you a price list of like, hey, uh, yes, uh, basically offer guest posting service on quality site. And then they have a huge price list of sites, right? Those are the so-called uh, link farms. So sites uh, that have been built uh, with the sole purpose of selling backlinks to people like us, like you, right? Because uh, they think that we don't know better. <laughs> so the main uh, way, so possibly the best way to avoid uh, reaching out to these people in the first place. Uh, so <clears throat> essentially, I truly believe that is to find sites uh, that are a particular legitimate, uh, uh, yeah, business or company, right? Because chances are that if a site is making uh, the majority of their revenue from an actual product or service, chances are that they are not going to basically need uh, to sell backlinks, right? 
uh, whether the link farm essentially been built for the purpose of selling backlinks. So that's how they make the entirety of the revenue essentially. Okay. So you want to find companies where they have something else to sell because then you know that they're not going to that then that they're not going to be incentivized to sell you the link okay uh step number four is personalization right so what this is is we basically uh, so first off uh, we find the best possible point of contact typically we try to find the writer of the article if we can't find them we find the editor uh, if we can't find them we find someone that works in marketing and lastly we try to find the owner if this is like a solo blog, okay? Uh, so the other thing is we want to know what is the best medium to reach out to them. So, so I would say like 80% we use emails for this, uh, but sometimes, for example, if we can't find the email or if we see that the person is specifically active on like Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, we might use those to reach out to, right? So it's important to find the right person in the right place at the right time. like. So these are the three main things if you want to get a reply, okay? And so, yeah, the last thing uh, here is that we also use this step to add or create like dynamic fields that are gonna change like dynamically inside our email templates. For the email templates, this is step number five, all right? Step uh, for the email templates, what we do is, uh, so instead of customizing each and every single email, uh, what we do is slightly different. So uh, So let's say, that we have this one topic and we have, for example, like three, uh, so actually five to six maybe segments for the topic, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have five different custom templates for each of these segments. So each of these templates is basically gonna make sense and be tailored to the specific segment that we have found for step number one. So this is why the strategy step here, finding this section and this segment, that makes sense is very important okay uh right so a couple of other pointers these are things that a lot of other people say uh so a lot of people know them but not a lot of people do them okay so i still see very bad emails that really don't do these things so uh, number one is to pick their interest right so you want to uh, make your email uh, like interesting so step number one the subject line should get people to open the email uh, then the first line of the email should be something uh, that makes them want to continue reading, okay? So step number two is to avoid fake flattery. So if you don't have anything to say, so so yeah, either don't say anything or like don't say fake stuff uh, just to impress people because that doesn't work, okay? The next thing is to showcase uh, the efforts that you put in uh, for the content. So if you spent 50 hours in creating this super, uh, super in-depth like data-driven content piece, uh, feel free to mention it, right? So a lot of people uh, <clears throat> basically are going to appreciate the effort uh, that you put in uh, for the content. The next thing is to use your why. So here is where you want to use the why that you found in step one, right? So why should they link to you? This is where you should use that. Then the next thing is to use the right tone of voice. Uh, this depends on the niche, the industry, the company that you're reaching out to, the role uh, for, the <clears throat> for the person that you're reaching out to and so on, okay? Uh, the next thing is to be funny, to like try and stand out where it makes sense. It's always good, I truly believe, to try and get people out of their daily routine whenever you can. So if you can like be funny, like make them smile, uh, that's always going to increase your chances of getting a reply. And so the last thing is to always follow up at least twice. Okay, uh, We typically use twice as the very bare minimum. Sometimes we also do three, four. Uh, there's a good... Uh, so there's a good kind of follow-up uh, thing that we've been trying lately, which is basically putting a follow-up like a month after the last follow-up, sometimes even a quarter after that, because <clears throat> then you can be like, uh, hey, uh, so I've been in touch uh, three months ago. <clears throat> so it looks like you're still uh, having this problem, like whatever so it is that you're reaching out for. Uh, do you still have this? Uh, can I help you now, right? Chances are people are going to be like maybe have something has changed in their situation so they might be more willing to reply okay right so cool uh, lastly to tie uh, to tie everything back to our three content promotion drivers okay uh, so yeah once you solved 
problem number one and two, we have a strategy and a plan. Uh, we have direction, right? So we know exactly where we need to go. <clears throat> Once we have solved problem number two and three, so we have a plan and a system, we have precision. So we know exactly how to get there. <clears throat> so lastly, once we have all of those, we have a strategy, we have a plan and we have a system. <clears throat> lastly, we have momentum so that we're able to scale over a period of time and where are we going? We don't need roads, <laughs> okay? Cheers, <laughs> that's it, thank you. Awesome job. That was a very thorough and we went really deep. Um, I think have time for maybe two questions. Uh, the first one's from Rahul. He said, is there any ratio towards using keyword difficulty levels? Uh, what do you mean with ratio? Yeah, he, I had asked for some clarification. He has not provided it yet. Um, we can move to the next one. Hmm. Is, is there a big difference between building links that go to your homepage versus scattering them out throughout the rest of your content pieces? Yeah, so that depends on what your goal is. Uh, typically, I recommend to newer sites to start uh, building links to the homepage, right? Because that does a couple of things. It, it can increase your domain rating so that it helps you rank higher for the internal pages, okay, with less effort. But the second thing that it can do, and that's probably the most important, is if you're doing it well, it can give you referral traffic. Uh, typically, for SaaS companies, which is like the majority of the clients that we work with, we run uh, listicle campaigns to get them featured in those articles that are, for example, top tools for this, top tools for that. And so what we try to do is we target uh, those listicles that are ranking on page one so that we can get the client placed in there with their own paragraph. So this builds a link to their homepage, but also uh, <clears throat> so it has the potential to uh, bring them referral traffic, right? Uh, which is also great uh, for uh, signups and conversions. <laughs> nice. And then, uh, I think the last question when you're discussing prospecting, um, do you actually create new articles to support your backlink um, outreach? Or are you just kind of looking at what's already existing on the client site and then using those? Uh, yeah, so we do both, uh, right? So for the for the clients that already have like amazing content, we typically just use that because that's typically enough. For the clients that have slightly weaker content, we might uh, move more towards like a uh, linkable assets, right? So we so we give them the idea, we essentially come up, uh, we do the ideation, they create the content, which might be like a study or something like that. So then we simply take that content and promote it to other people. Super cool, awesome. And thanks again for your time and everybody else's time today. Yeah, thank you guys, um, it's been great. We will send out the recording and recap and the, the free templates that Alan's provided tomorrow around 11 a.m. Central. Um, but before we jump off and give everybody their time back, Alan, do you have anything you wanted to share? Um, any uh, words? No, nothing much. I mean, yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter. I'm I'm pretty active in there. And if you just want to reach out to say hi or or tell me what you thought about the webinar, I'm happy to chat. Awesome. Well, everybody have a great rest of your day and we'll talk soon. Now, before we wrap this up, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe so you don't miss out on more great content from the industry's best SEOs, content marketers, and content strategists. The ClearScope webinar series happens every week and helps SEO content creators of all skill levels advance their knowledge. Hope to see you tune in next time.